Welcome to the wonderful village of Tynemouth, located just eight miles down the River Tyne from the great city of Newcastle. As its name suggests, Tynemouth sits at the mouth of the legendary River Tyne here, where it flows into the North Sea. Looking over the river mouth, on the opposite bank in the distance, we can see the town of South Shields, while a little further upstream, on this northern side of the river, is North Shields. Both of the shields are famous cradles of Tyneside history, but Tynemouth here is an equally fascinating place to explore, all the while home to a beautiful seaside atmosphere and some unique landmarks. Here, overlooking the river from high up on this steep bank, stands the Collingwood Monument, one of the largest statues in Britain. At 23 feet or 7 metres tall, the statue depicts Vice Admiral Lord Cuthbert Collingwood, born just up the river in Newcastle in 1748. Though not a household name across the country, Collingwood is often described as an unsung hero of British history. Most famously, he led the Royal Navy in partnership with Lord Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805 during the Napoleonic Wars. Nelson died at Trafalgar and was later commemorated with his famous column on London's Trafalgar Square, which admittedly stands quite a bit taller than Collingwood's column here in Tynemouth. This statue of Collingwood was erected in 1845, a couple of years after Nelson's column, and it was placed here overlooking the mouth of the River Tyne deliberately to echo Collingwood's long connection with the Tyne and the sea. What's more, Collingwood, who went on to become one of the great naval commanders of British history, has a deep connection with this part of Tyneside, as part of his family lived in North Shields, which neighbours Tynemouth here. And as we now make our way away from the riverside towards the centre of Tynemouth village, it was from this region that Collingwood's illustrious naval career began. He joined the Royal Navy at the age of 13, and came to develop a strong relationship with Horatio Nelson, who joined a few years later. And by 1804, one year after the outbreak of the Napoleonic Wars, Collingwood was promoted to the position of Vice Admiral alongside Nelson, with whom he led the Navy at Trafalgar in 1805, where Britain gained a crucial victory over France to gain control of the seas. Ultimately, however, Collingwood died at sea in 1810, but his legacy remains strong in this part of the country. But where exactly in this part of the country would you find Tynemouth here on a map? Well, as you can see, Tynemouth sits at the very end of the 73 mile long River Tyne, part of the heavily populated Tyneside region. And at the mouth of the river that gives this proud region its name, we can see the massive Tynemouth Pier, stretching out into the North Sea in the distance before us. The pier is half a mile long, and was built to protect Tynemouth and North Shields from the sea. It's so massive though, that the pier took a staggering 56 years to build, but the protection it afforded was crucial, as the mouth of the Tyne here has been a place of real significance for centuries. From the medieval era, Tynemouth played a major role in trade along the Tyne, but it also found itself clashing in a centuries-long dispute over shipping rights with what was then the town of Newcastle, further upstream. While at the time, Newcastle was the more powerful town and port, owing to its booming coal trade, Tynemouth was able to stake its claim in what was often a vicious trading dispute on the back of its historical significance to the River Tyne as a whole. And up above us here, we can see the remnants of that historical significance, the ruins of Tynemouth Priory, which was first established almost 1400 years ago in the early 7th century AD. Positioned on top of a large crag that juts out into the North Sea, Tynemouth Priory is the most important landmark in the history of this village. After it was first established, the monastery was a site of fair importance in the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Northumbria, but this lasted only around 150 years, until the beginning of Viking raids changed everything. From 800 AD until the 11th century, 
Viking assaults destroyed the monks' community here on the coast, and Tynemouth, which had gained quite a lofty status, declined in grandeur, becoming a bit of a Viking outpost at the height of their power in England. However, in the year 1086, the ruined priory here was finally rebuilt, marking the beginning of Tynemouth as we know it today, as a small community of monks began to develop the site. Tynemouth Priory soon developed into a grand castle, and it was surrounded by strong walls and a major moat, the outline of which can still clearly be seen to this day. Inevitably, the Priory's prominent position overlooking the entry point to the Tyne made it a site of immense strategic value. However, its initial fortification actually came about when its effective owner, the Earl Mowbray, rebelled against the King. As Earl of Northumbria, Mowbray had great power in this region, owning castles at Newcastle, Morpeth, Bamborough and more. By 1095, as he began work on strengthening and fortifying Tynemouth Priory, he became part of a plot to overthrow the then King William II, but he was swiftly defeated and arrested. However, as we look down Front Street past the village clock tower, Mowbray's defeat was just the start of the growth of Tynemouth Castle and Priory. With financial support from the wealthy monastery at St Albans over 200 miles to the south, the Priory here at the mouth of the Tyne began to boom, with its wealth growing significantly. From the 12th century, the wealth of the Priory here prompted civilians to settle around it, and as such, the village of Tynemouth began to evolve outside. The building that we see here today dates from roughly that time, with stone walls built in the 12th and 13th centuries to surround the historic priory, and which also served the purpose of defending the priory from the regular threat of Scottish raids, which were fought off successfully in the year 1314. Now to get an idea of just how prominent a landmark the priory is here in Tynemouth, let's take a look down off the main headland towards the beach. Down here, we can see the popular little beach known as King Edward's Bay, which on a warm and sunny day like this is an irresistible attraction to the many people of Tyneside. King Edward's Bay is nestled between the Priory and the Clifftop Hotels behind it, but it's not the only famous beach to be found in Tynemouth. Further up the coast in the direction we're looking, you'll find the much, much larger Long Sands Beach a mile-long stretch of sand that was once named as one of the best beaches in the world. Now looking back towards the Priory here, this site also has a long history with royalty, having hosted a number of kings through the years. Before the current building was constructed, three kings were buried here at Tynemouth, including King Oswin and Osred of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Northumbria, and later King Malcolm III of Scotland, who was buried here after he was famously killed and defeated at the Battle of Annick in 1093. And the burial of those three kings is the reason that you'll see three crowns appearing on Tynemouth's coat of arms. But as we now shift focus away from the Priory, we find ourselves beside another symbol of Tynemouth, the Clock Tower, which stands proudly at the top of Front Street. Built in 1861, the clock tower is an icon of Tynemouth in the Victorian era, which, along with the period of prosperity in the medieval era, was one of the great epochs in Tynemouth's history. Much of the village today is made up of Victorian and Georgian era architecture, such as Old House here, a spectacular Georgian house that dates from the mid 18th century. And hidden just next door to Old House, meanwhile, is the last remaining active church on Front Street, Our Lady and St Oswin's Catholic Church, which was built in 1890. Though constructed during that time of Victorian prosperity, the church in 1940 suffered heavy damage when it was hit by a bomb dropped by the Luftwaffe during what was known as the Newcastle Blitz. At the time, the presence of heavy industry on Tyneside led to the region becoming a key German target in the bombing of Britain, focusing primarily on factories in and around Newcastle and Gateshead, 
but also extending all the way along to Tynemouth, which suffered significantly. During the Blitz, 225 people in Tynemouth were sadly killed, while thousands of houses and buildings were damaged. This heavy impact on a village with relatively less heavy industry than further up the Tyne was simply a result of Tynemouth's position on the coast, leaving the village vulnerable to bombs being hastily dropped by the Luftwaffe, who would often seek to turn around and head home as quickly as they could. We'll talk more about Tynemouth and its coastal defences in a little while, but here on Front Street, the house covered in scaffolding here is a famous little spot. It's known as the Martineau Guest House, and was named after a notable former guest, one Harriet Martineau, often called Britain's first female journalist and sociologist, who lived here in Tynemouth from 1840 to 45. A major intellectual of the era, Martineau, born all the way down in Norwich, was famous for her countless novels and academic writings. She then moved to Tynemouth to rest by the sea during a period of ill health, but later went on to pen further groundbreaking works on important issues. In fact, Martineau's writings are thought to have furthered the cause for the abolition of slavery in the United States in the 19th century. Meanwhile, as we continue down Front Street, you'll have noticed a number of pubs that line the road on either side. On a sunny day, Tynemouth's pubs and cafes make the village a bustling, yet still relaxing place to be, and serve as a nice reminder of the village's Victorian heyday. During the Victorian era, Tynemouth was indeed prosperous in trade through the busy port at neighbouring North Shields, but this village in particular was known as a haven for relaxation. With coal and shipbuilding booming along the Tyne, there was a huge growth in the population in Newcastle, but the city quickly suffered issues of overcrowding. As a result, Tynemouth's quaint streets, gorgeous beaches and fresh sea air offered a bit of an escape from the industrial metropolis for many, soon becoming a favourite destination for Geordies as seaside holidays grew in popularity. And while the heyday of the Great British Seaside Holiday is long gone, Tynemouth remains one of the most beloved spots in the region, in recent years being named among the best seaside towns in the country and one of the best places to live in England's northeast. And it's not hard to see why Tynemouth is so beloved. As we look up at the spire of the former Congregational Church, another Victorian landmark, this village is full of character on every corner. From seaside scenery to colourful flowers, old houses and majestic cliffs, Tynemouth is certainly one of the most characterful places on Tyneside. And as we head away from the bustling heart of the village on Front Street, there's even more history to explore on Tynemouth's gorgeous streets. Here we're approaching Huntingdon Place, before which there stands a grand memorial of Queen Victoria, which was erected here in 1902. One of the many statues you'll find of the Queen in her iconic pose, this monument is just one element of an intriguing history in this part of Tynemouth. We'll head into the square located behind Victoria's statue in a moment or two, but it's actually in the houses that overlook the square where we'll find a surprising bit of heritage. Sitting just over the road from Front Street, this elegant row of Victorian terraced houses once played host to a distinguished guest. That was one Giuseppe Garibaldi, the man who famously brought about the unification of Italy and who, perhaps even more notably, had a biscuit named after him. In 1854, seven years before the unification of Italy, Garibaldi made a famous visit to Tyneside, during which time he stayed in the house that stands just ahead of us here. At the time, Garibaldi was a much-loved figure across Europe, and as his plans for his homeland gained traction, he came here to tell politicians and industrialists of his ambitions and plans for a unified Italy. And interestingly, it was this visit that inspired the name of the Garibaldi Biscuit, which was first manufactured in Britain in 1861, the year that the unified Kingdom of Italy was first proclaimed. But looking the other way now, 
In the square surrounded by houses, we can see Tynemouth War Memorial, which was placed here in 1938, just before the start of the Second World War. Earlier on, we were talking about the bombing of Tynemouth by the Luftwaffe, but this village was also defended at the time by a storied unit of the British Army, the Tynemouth Volunteer Artillery, who were claimed to be the British Army's oldest volunteer artillery unit, having been founded all the way back in 1859. However, the Tynemouth Volunteer Artillery aren't the only famous volunteer unit here, as the village is also the home of the equally illustrious Tynemouth Volunteer Life Brigade, or TVLB. Founded back in 1864, the volunteers of the TVLB have saved countless lives from the rough and often freezing waters off the coast here, and their efforts certainly haven't gone unnoticed. As we look at the village's South African War Memorial, erected in 1903, the Tynemouth Volunteer Life Brigade have been honoured with their own museum, located down by the coast near the Collingwood Monument where we started our walk. The museum details their heroic story since 1864, and it's one of a number of great things to do on a day out when visiting Tynemouth. Sadly, however, we're approaching the end of our walk for today, but before we finish up, there's one more spectacular spot that we've got to see. Just down the road away from the heart of the village, you'll find Tynemouth Station, which is today located on the Tyne and Weir Metro. Tynemouth Station, which we can see just in front of us now, was actually built all the way back in 1882, long before the metro system was even conceived around Newcastle. The Tyne and Weir Metro began operation in 1980, with the historic Tynemouth Station here converted to greet metro trains at the easternmost point of the line on North Tyneside. But despite that, it takes just half an hour on the train to reach Tynemouth from Newcastle, which means that a day by the sea is easily accessible for anybody in the big city. As well as holidays though, Tynemouth Station also serves another use, with its expansive historic platforms interestingly serving as the village's local marketplace. As we venture inside the station, markets have indeed taken place in Tynemouth since the medieval era, when the village first emerged surrounding the castle and priory. However, the marketplace has since moved into the old station building, taking place under the ornate station roof on both sides of the metro tracks every week on Saturdays and Sundays. And every month, the market doubles as a farmer's market, which draws in many visitors from around Tyneside. It's a wonderful venue to host the market, and another demonstration of just how lovely a village Tynemouth is to explore or even live in. The station as we see it today too has been brought up to its Victorian era glory with a restoration back in 2012, and it makes for a wonderful welcome to Tynemouth if you're arriving by train. But sadly, this is also where we've now reached the end of our walk around the delightful village of Tynemouth. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're now looking forward to visiting Tynemouth for yourself for a great day out by the sea.